So this is the second instalment of the London School of Pediatrics question-based journal club. Um, I've added uh, the, uh, the question-based idea here just to make clear that this isn't so much journal club in the sense where we say, oh, here's an interesting article, let's look at it. But ideally, we're trying to be rooted in our clinical practice and start with scenarios and find evidence that might, uh, might help inform our actions in a scenario, or at least inform our discussions around guideline development and things like that. Uh, there are four of us involved today. So myself and Susan and Defna, uh, we are helping to facilitate the session and uh, we've helped to design the, the format of the sessions. And um, Abdi, uh, who's from St George's, uh, is the one who's come up with the question and done the search and found a piece of evidence for us to review this week. And um, so he is going to be uh, presenting uh, the, that scenario and question to us as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, just to give an outline and uh, we'll run through some of the background again because we can't guarantee the same people come each week. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the concept of this style of journal club uh, and then we'll outline the principles and the process of evidence-based medicine. Then Abdi will give us the clinical scenario, a focused question, and outline a search that's been undertaken and the uh, piece of evidence that he suggested. Um, Susie will then introduce the group work that we'll undertake, uh, we'll distribute the links to the resources and we will uh, provide, uh, help you decide whether you're going to look at the validity of the evidence or the results. We'll then feed that back together as a group and we'll consider how we may be able to apply this evidence to the, to the case in point. Uh, and then uh, and uh, definitely will lead on, on that section. And then I will wrap up and we'll uh, potentially plan for, for future sessions um, and I'll signpost some useful resources. An important disclaimer, just to emphasize that uh, we're reviewing the evidence here and while it may be valid and it may be able to inform our clinical decision-making, uh, don't take what we're discussing as medical advice. So don't use it as a reason to override local guidance. Um, but obviously, if you think it mandates local guidance to be reviewed, then do take it uh, to your department for discussion. All right. So the proposal is that what we do is an interactive journal club that we have someone who has come up with a question from a clinical scenario, has done a search and has found a single piece of evidence uh, that they can uh, they want us to review. We then appraise it as a group. Um, and we, we poll what people's views are both before and after they review the evidence. Um, the rationale for having a journal club like this is, is that hopefully it's more relevant to have it rooted in a, in a clinical question that arises from our practice. Um, that by, by getting everyone to join in the work of doing the appraisal, actually we all learn uh, by reviewing rather than just one person presenting us their own appraisal. Um, and hopefully it gives us more opportunities for each of us to identify our needs in terms of uh, learning about evidence-based medicine and practicing it and uh, helps us to provide the appropriate teaching and resources and we get to see if the evidence changes our views. So the principles of evidence-based medicine, this is a sort of Venn diagram that's often shown, it's not really a Venn diagram I guess, but it's just illustrating that it's not just about blindly doing what a paper tells us to, even if that paper may be very good, so the research may be excellent. It's about taking the evidence, the best evidence we can find, and applying it to patients based on their values and their preferences using our expertise as well and our expertise is important um, and taking into account important factors in our environment in our circumstances that may mean that some excellent evidence is not applicable where we work because a drug is not available um, or something is is too costly and so integrating all of these things requires judgment. And actually, that's why I find the practice of evidence-based medicine something that's really interesting and enjoyable, because it's not just about crunching numbers um, and uh, doing statistics. It's about making often quite nuanced decisions based on limited evidence, but integrating that with what you know from your experience and what your patient's values and preferences are. The process that we tend to go through is to have a clinical scenario which gives us some uncertainty about what to do, to try and distill that uncertainty into a focused question and then search for some evidence that might help us answer that question, pick out what we think might best help us to, to answer that question and then appraise that 
and the appraisal we'll discuss in a little while, we tend to think about in three different components, thinking about whether that evidence is itself valid internally, does it successfully answer the question it sets out to answer, or is it subject to very severe biases? And also then thinking about what the actual results of the study are. Do they, does the study give us important results that could influence our practice? And then critically thinking about whether those valid and important results can be applied uh, to, to our patient or our population. So that leads us to need to make a decision, which may be the hardest bit of trying to do as, a, as, a, as a, an online group, but we try and poll you to see what your thoughts are. And once you've made a decision and you've acted, of course, you can evaluate that and find out whether uh, the treatment you give has the effect that you hope. So in terms of the way we're doing that here, uh, we have a nominated team or individual who generates the scenario question and search and finds the evidence. And then we as a group appraise the evidence and we, we may come to a decision. So that hopefully allows us both to learn by example and to learn by doing. What is a focus question? You'll see an example today, but we tend to focus them around the letters P, I, C, O, and possibly a T. So that's P, C, O, um, P being what patient or population we're interested in, I being the intervention, uh, if we're thinking about a treatment, or exposure, if we're thinking about a risk factor, um, C being the comparison, what we're interested in it being different from, um, which in an interventional trial might be no treatment or standard of care or a placebo, and O would be the outcomes that we think are relevant. The time scale just reminds us that outcomes, we often need to think about what sort of time frame that matters when we say death. Do we mean death within a week or death within a year? And um, we can use this PCOT framework for questions about treatments, tests, prognosis, risk factors, and other things. And um, it does, when, when I teach evidence-based medicine, um, I often find it causes a bit of a headache because I think people feel like it's a straight jacket, but it's just a tool to help us make our question clear so that we can communicate it to other people. And, uh, and it helps us then when we find evidence to see how well that evidence speaks to our question. The other thing you may have come across a lot is the idea of a hierarchy of evidence. And this comes out from the fact that, well, there are different types of study that are suitable to answer different types of questions. And there may be multiple types of studies which could give some evidence towards a certain question. But some types of studies may be intrinsically less prone to bias. So, for example, for interventional studies, um, we may prefer a randomized trial rather than a simple prospective cohort study where doctors made the decisions which treatment to give patients because the randomization should remove the bias that comes from deciding who receives which treatment. Um, and so it's important to have some understanding of hierarchies of evidence when you practice evidence-based medicine, but the quality of the individual study matters. So that means that actually you may have uh, one question where actually there's only a really small and very poorly conducted randomized controlled trial. And that might mean that a well-executed observational study might be the best evidence you can get. So the hierarchy is not fixed. All right, so Abdi, if you could turn your microphone on, um, you can tell us about the clinical scenario. Okay, th thanks, Andrew. And uh, so basically, my name is Abdi. I'm one of the SHOs here at St. George's. I wanted to sort of quickly go through uh, one of the clinical scenarios. And the scenario at hand, sorry, one second, let me just bring up. So basically, this is um, set at um, Kingston Hospital, where you are the a pediatric registrar where you've just seen a six-year-old girl who's presented with a history of fever and sore throat for three days. She's got a minimal cough and there are some cervical lymphadenopathy that you can feel and there's some tonsillar exudate that you can see as well. And following your clinical examination you are happy for her to go home with a course of um, penicillin B for a strapped uh, throat. And the SHO tells you that she was given five day prescriptions at her last hospital and that sort of leaves you thinking because you're used to giving 10 days and you're told the main reason why you give 10 days is because of uh, a prolonged course and higher higher rates of eradication and preventing and um, complications and in terms of in terms of the clinical question this raises is that and it makes you think in children less than 18 years of 18 years and in children who are less than 18 years old who have a confirmed group A strep uh, tonsillitis, is a five-day course of Hen B as effective 
as a 10 day course and when it comes to achieving symptomatic cure and also bacteria eradication as well. So, so then think it, having this question in mind, you sort of go through the whole PICO process. So in terms of the population, you're thinking the population, the population you want to um, sort of delve deeper in is those who are less than eight, 18 years old with a group A strep infection. The intervention and the comparison that you're trying to compare against each other is a five to seven day course versus a 10 day course or PENV. And in terms of outcomes, what you're looking at is you're looking at and whether there was symptomatic cure and bacterial eradication and any uh, relapse and also any any complications as well and with with that in mind what uh, what we did was we went through the whole um, search search methods and uh, we used three platforms we used pubmed trip and cochrane and database as well and and as you can see on the slides, those were some of the keywords that we use in terms of coming up with uh, results. And starting off with PubMed, we used, when we used PubMed, sorry, and we found that there was 82 results uh, with that strategy. However, there was only three that, that we thought was relevant to our PQ question. And when it came to TRIP database, and again, it was, it was useful, but it contained, it gave us uh, 143 results. And however, we didn't really feel that there were any that were uh, that were appropriate or that were relevant to our to our case. So we haven't really used much from from that database. And lastly, we used the Cochrane uh, database as well. This generated uh, five results. One was looking at uh, whether the short term duration of antibiotics versus a uh, standard course of antibiotics, uh, your ten days, has any difference at all. But but one other thing that we sort of found was that actually. It, well, most of the studies were sort of comparing newer antibiotics and, and, and the efficacy in terms of uh, eradication and cure uh, with PENV rather than PENV against ben, PENV. And so that in mind, what we did was we sort of uh, went back to the drawing board, try and think about what, what we'll classify as, as good evidence to consider in, this, in, this, in, in helping us answer this clinical question. So we wanted, we wanted one that ideally had a pediatric focus, but then actually we were I'm and ahhing about how we would feel if the evidence also included both adults and children as well. And, and the other second point we, we ideally wanted was we wanted a random, randomized control trial, but we were also happy with a systematic uh, review as well. And lastly, we needed um, our evidence to sort of um, to be involved in comparing shorter duration of antibiotics versus longer, longer duration, specifically when it comes to pen V. And in terms of the articles that we found, and the, so it was a bit of a it was a bit of a struggle, and because the difficulty was that sort of, and there were there were difficulty that we sort of comp that I get, that we came across was that there were sort of there were there were there were studies, and most of these studies were sort of looking at how different antibiotics tre treated group A strep. However, it was it was a bit of a struggle trying to find like for like in terms of Pen V versus Pen V, and so that's that's the first article where they were looking at an azithromycin versus Pen V. And in the second article was sort of, uh, it was similar as well in this case. And this was by German researchers who were sort of, who did a prospective study and they were looking at whether a shorter course of antibiotic therapy reduced both streptococcal sequelae. But the only reason we didn't really go ahead with the second article was actually, and it compared 10 days of PENV versus five days of six different antibiotics. And, and, and patients being classified, patients being allocated to different different groups of these antibiotics. And lastly, and the third article I came across was uh, similar to, um, which was sought by a group of group researchers as well, who compared the eradication of group A strep by comparing three different antibiotics again. And so it was it was a bit of a um, it was a bit of a struggle, but we were we were able to. And find three articles, uh, which was uh, sorry about that. <laughs> I, I played around with the animation of the slides, and I think I I made I, I messed it up. And in terms of the articles that we found, and there were three that met our search criteria. The first paper was by a group of an American pediatrician that was published back in 1987, so quite a while back. And then there was also a systematic review as well that sort of, that pulled and studies and that pulled in studies that were comparing shorter and longer courses of the same antibiotics. And there were sort of five studies on, on PENV. 
but the issue with this was sort of it was it was mostly the issues that we the issues that we came across with this with those two first articles was that they were actually mostly old trials and they were actually quite smaller and 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 yeah but however it does sort of show the benefit of systematic uh, review and actually one one thing that we did consider was that perhaps and and one thing that we did consider was perhaps actually we, we if we had more time compared to these systematic reviews and these randomized control trials we, will, we would have probably done a bit more to get but for the quick answer and and we found the last paper which was the last paper of the third which was by um, a group of swedish researchers in and that was published in 2019 and this was and this was and um, much more recent which was a good and it had a bigger bigger sample group compared to the previous two researchers to previous two papers i mentioned as well and yeah is that and so that's 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 the paper that those those are the three papers that we found great Thank you very much, uh, Abdi. And then before you before you mute yourself, Abdi, I just wonder what were your thoughts when you, in your PICO you defined P as children under 18 years with group A strep. What did you mean when you said a child has group A strep for your, from your UK clinical practice? So it was and it was, it was fascinating because when, when you looked at some of the some of the initially for us it was we often sort of. From clinical practice we, we often have a suspicion we do a swab but we discharge them yeah. home with, with 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 antibiotics if if yeah. we're worried but i think i think it didn't really meet the sort of the confirmational the 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 method of confirmation that was used in most of these studies that we came across because okay. they 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 had things like rapid rapid tests but i think yeah. it's one of those things that sort of probably might vary between hospitals yeah so, good. so that I think that's something that's just something to bear in mind, because I think we may be coming back to that when we then review the evidence. OK, great. Thank you, Abdi. So um, there's okay. no system within GoToMeeting for us to do proper polls. So I'm going to ask you to type into the chat box your current view on whether you would like to give this child a 10 day or a five day course of penicillin V. Um, so you could just write 10 days or five days and um, if you've got a nuanced view or you want to give some rationale please fire ahead fire away but you'll otherwise just write 10 days or five days just so we can poll your current views thank you i'm seeing some answers already and susie if you want to take over at this point and then I can I can keep a count on people's answers. Yeah, sure. Um, Good, we've got lots of answers coming in. So while those answers are coming in, I'll let you start introducing the mission and I will keep a summary of people's answers. Okay, so now comes the more interesting part. So you um, should have a link to the paper that Abdi found that fits his um, question best. And then if you can click on the link that Andrew's about to post, which will generate a random number. So if you click on the link, it'll open a Google page. And if you're a one, you have just to look at the validity of the study. And if you are a two, you have to look at the results. So uh, when it opens on Google, it will have either a one or two there. So that will tell you which group you're in. Um, and then everyone should read the abstract. But the, for the validity, so if you're a number one, then please look at the methods and the demographic table. And for results, look at the results. Um, if you click on the CAS tool, it will launch the um, CAS checklist for a randomized controlled trial that you should be able to type directly into. So if you're doing either the validity or results, have a look and then type in what you think into the, the framework. And we'll come back to that when um, Daphne brings back for feedback. So don't read the introduction, don't read the conclusions, read the bits in bold. Has everyone got the paper been randomised? And 
here's some more helpful hints to think about what you should be asking yourself. So if you're in the validity, you're really looking at the design. So try and read through it and see if you can picture in your head, um, is there any signs of any bias that could sway the results from the study? So just look carefully very at the design, how they did it, um, because you want to think of any impact that might have on the on the results that they're publishing. And for the results, um, have a look at the estimates of effect and the relationship. How precise are these? So that's by looking at your confidence intervals. Um, do they exclude no effect? So looking at the relative risk of one, best difference of zero, and there should be a, a link to the evidence-based website if you need any help for any statistics. In the list of resources. Oh yeah, I can put, I'll put those resources up. But just to say, if you, if you enter things that you really don't understand that you want some help with, just use the text box and we'll, we're very happy to chat away with you either publicly or privately um, as we're doing this. But the first link there, Oxford Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine, will have all the terms. So if you've forgotten what something means, it will have a nice little description there of what everything is. And I've shared the link to both the paper and the appraisal framework, which you can type into when you open it on a computer. Are you still there, Susie? Yes. Yep. Oh, still. great. Lovely. I was just moving on to the, the slide introducing the timings. Oh, yep. Yeah. So we thought 20 minutes. So we started probably, what, five minutes ago? Yeah. So 15 more minutes. Yeah. And here's a reminder. So this is our question. So what Abdi has come up with for this scenario. So this is what you should have in your mind when you're reading the paper. Is it answering the question, looking at the population, intervention, comparison and outcome that we've selected? Um, and those were just the hints for if you're looking at the validity or if you're looking at the results. But if you have any problems or anything you just want a little bit of a hint for, um, just message either us directly or if you just post in the group.
So just 10 more minutes, um, so if you're on the validity, um, just try to be heading towards the final question, same for results, and if you have anything, just pop it on and we'll reply.
two minutes to go guys and then we're all going to bring it back hopefully you've all got on okay Okay, everybody, um, let's um, start getting the feedback from everybody. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about validity first, and then we'll talk about the results. So whoever was in the validity group, um, we're going to start walk, talking through the CLASP uh, toolkit, essentially, to get it the feedback in a structured way. So that's what we'll start to do now. And Andrew is going to be typing for us um, so that we get everything recorded through. So I'm <laughs> typing badly. I'm sure it's, it will be amazing. OK, um, so from the first group. This is just as a reminder, looking at the study design itself and the quality of the study design. So did we think that the trial addressed addressed a clearly focused issue if you can just write that onto the chat and we can collate the results andrew we can't hear you i don't think Okay, looks like that is an overwhelming yes. So we think that the population is appropriate, the intervention and comparison used were um, outlined clearly as are the outcomes. I think then we can move on to the next question. Yes, George, we're going to talk about that in terms of the applicability at the next stage. Uh, but in terms of just answering the question, does this study uh, have a good clinical question that they're trying to ask? Um, we think that it's an appropriate way of asking this question. So the next question we're going to ask is, was the assignment of patients to treatments randomized? So what did you think about the randomization? And did you think that the randomization um, was done well? And if so, why? Apologies, my internet went there. OK. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, we're getting sort of a everyone saying that it's computer randomized, which is great and allocated accordingly. It's centrally done. 
just want to pick up a point here that's coming out about blinding. Um, what do you mean by blinded computer allocation, George? You can talk if you want as well. It just wanted to clarify this point because randomization is separate to the blinding process. Um, randomization is just allocating the person, the given group, without knowing. So it, when you don't know which group you're going to be allocated to, it's called an al concealment rather than blinding itself, just to clarify that. Excellent. OK. Yes. OK. So yeah, just to separate the two points about um, in the study where the blinding is versus the allocation concealment of the randomization. OK. Um, so yes. So we think that the study has a good randomization process. It's uh, computerized. It's using allocation concealment um, and that they do that through sort of um, opaque envelopes. OK, so the next question is, were all the patients who entered the trial properly accounted for at the conclusion? Did you think that this was the case? And um, oh, yes. Yep. So I can't tell. OK, what, um, so the reason this is a yes is because they're using something called an intention to treat, which they mentioned. So any person who drops out of the trial is included for through the intention to treat analysis. So they look at both those who left the study and the dropouts, so the per protocol analysis and also the intention to treat analysis. So yeah, by so the having the here isn't that they kept everyone in the study, but it's that you know what happened to people, even if people did drop out. Yes. And the reason to do this and the importance of it is to avoid the selection bias that might come out of dropping out in a unequal manner. OK, so the question then is, now that we've looked at the focused issue, the randomization, do you think this is worth continuing? Do we want to read the next stage? Excellent. Yes, we can got a yes. That. OK, good. I'll take that. So now we're going to talk a bit about uh, blinding. Um, so going back to what we were talking about, blinding, do you, what is the blinding process of this study and do you think it was feasible to blind this? Which parts are blinded? Yeah. So George says not blinded after allocation. So those who are receiving the um, antibiotics know that they're having X dose three times a day or four times a day. So are the doctors who are prescribing it and so are the people. Yeah, excellent. People are saying cannot blind. That's interesting. Why could this study not be blinded? Yes, that's a, why do you think? So two points here. Uh, the first, before we move on, is that the analysis is actually blinded to the statisticians who are analysing the study, so that's good, but the rest of it isn't blinded. And why is it not feasible to blind? The dosing is different, but yes, um, E sounds, yes, E um, made a good point there, that you could potentially use different, um, well, you can use a fourth medicine as a placebo in the three drug uh, the three dose protocol for example which could help you blind yes exactly that's what george yeah. said so although this would be quite an expensive thing to do but yes you can potentially do it 
Yeah. And then also they decided in their protocol to follow people up at five days to seven days after they finished their treatment, which then means that, well, of course, they're unblinded because you know when they're, when they're coming after their treatment. Absolutely. And what does it mean that the, in, that the investigators were blinded? Why is that good? I think it was Ruth that had mentioned that. Oh, there we go. She's answered. Oh, no, sorry. But Ruth had yes, mentioned that. Yes, that's making a very good point. But yes, if you, if you made everyone take 10 days of treatment, but half of them got five days of placebo at the end, you wouldn't be able to see any effects on whether the shorter course had better adherence, which is very true. So there's a difference sometimes when, it, when you have trials between what's pragmatic and what makes, you know, clear. And Andrew? Oh, sorry, I went, I went muted. Was, yeah, sorry, I was just saying that um, there's a, sometimes a tension between what is scientifically the most rigorous, which would be placebo controlled and everything, and what is pragmatically more relevant, because actually Ruth's correct, you wouldn't be able to look at outcomes of adherence if everyone had to take 10 days of treatment and half of them got five days of placebo. Absolutely. Okay. So that's about blinding. And and thanks, George. That's what, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So the investigators can't sort of do the analysis any way they please. Sorry, I'm. All right, I'm muting myself. <laughs> that's okay. Um, we'll move on just because of time. We'll move on to the next part. Um, so the next question is: Are the groups similar at the start of the trial? So are we? Do we have a fair start? Are the two groups that we're going to be comparing similar? So Andy said yes. Excellent. So we're happy that we have a fair start at each group. And as for the sixth question, uh, now we're going on to, aside from the experimental intervention, were the groups treated equally? Those who received and those who received three three days for five days, three, a TDS for 10 days, sorry, or QDS for four days. So did you think that the groups were equal in the way that they were treated once they were given the intervention? Okay, so I'm getting a lot of yeses there. Yes. There was, of course, a difference in the follow up times, which was part of their plan. Which they had highlighted before the study started, yes. So that's looking at the design of the study. So we've said that they've tried to minimize biases by following these. So we think that the study gives us the best opportunity to look at the results. So we're going to move on to section B, which is looking a bit more at the results and what they might mean. So the next, so now we're gonna move on to the second group who was looking specifically at the results. And if I can get you to have a look at the CASP toolkit, that number, question number seven, which specifically asks how large was the treatment effect? Was it significant or not significant? Actually, before we even do that, uh, what was the um, treatment effect that they were specifically looking at, just as a sort of um, recap? Yes. So the clinical cure, and um, Andy mentioned non-inferior outcome for five-day course, and the non-inferior inferior outcome was 10% difference between the two groups. So the 10% difference in absolute risk that they were talking about. So now that we've said that, 
was the um so that we're now looking at table number two and we're looking at the primary endpoint where they're telling you the percentage of people that were cured after having five days and ten days of antibiotic and they're giving you the treatment effect of a absolute risk difference so that's minus 3.7 is that result significant I think Sudeep's not significant. Sudeep said significant. Who else? Well, I, I think, I, I guess, Sudeep, maybe you're meaning that it's the result we were looking for, which is that there's no difference. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. So, exactly. So, the way we look at it here is um, we look at the absolute risk difference and we want to see between the two groups is the absolute risk dis difference statistically significant? or not and if it is not that means that um the trial is well sorry one group is not inferior to the other group and yeah as Sudeep mentioned at the very end as well so going back to the question The next question, which is how precise was the estimate of the treatment effect? So we've mentioned this a little bit, but just to focus a bit more on the confidence intervals, what do you think about the precision of the estimate? And how can we tell the pre how precise something is from a confidence interval? Yes. So Khalid has mentioned that as well. So when we look at the confidence interval range, it's not very wide. So that suggests that um, it's a pretty good estimate. And it's, as Andrew's writing there, less than 10%. So therefore, it excludes the inferior range. The other thing is that we would say that the, there's no significant difference between the two groups' risks because it passes zero. Anything else anybody wanted to mention at that point? Because we had mentioned, we well, had thought- That's a very good question. How do you determine if a confidence interval is considered wide or not? Well, that's a clinical decision. You know, so it's how it does that is how much does that matter to you? So if we said that the the confidence interval around the absolute risk difference went from minus 50% to plus 50%, we would say clinically that matters a lot. Um, if you were talking about, you know, one in two fewer patients being cured or one in two more pa patients being cured. So it's very much about thinking about the clinical reality of what those numbers mean. So in this case, we're saying that the, the difference in clinical cure, we think it's going to be no worse than 10%. 10 percentage points fewer, which means one in 10 patients not being cured in the worst case. And they decided before they did the study that that was acceptable for a five day course over a 10 day course. Obviously, you can decide yourself whether you think that's acceptable. OK. So we've had a look at the primary um, outcome. Uh, that's, I'm just aware that we've only got sort of five minutes to wrap it all up. So we won't look at the other secondary outcomes that they looked at, but it's um, an interesting point to make was just that we looked at the bacterial eradication um, at test of cure, which showed that um, significantly more people had still had strep A um, carriage at the point of testing who had five days of antibiotics. Um, and that's something just to think about and whether or not this is actually an important thing in the study. Yes, thanks, Sudeep. Yeah. 
Uh, well, moving on to the and, and thanks yeah, worth, worth remembering just just that that one well, just worth remembering that the bacterial swab was done at different times so the five day group had their swab done on day 10 to 12 whereas the 10 day group had it done on day 15 to 17 so remember that when you're interpreting And now moving on to the applicability, which is uh, the bit that we had mentioned at the beginning. I think uh, both George and uh, I believe Ruth had mentioned it. Uh, do you think this study applies um, to our population, our paediatric population? I think this is a question for everyone. George, you used the lovely word of tentatively. Why is that? Oh, Rachel said tentative as well. Okay, so Rachel's um, saying that it did include children, but we're looking at adults. And do you think in this scenario where we're looking at tonsillitis that there would be a huge difference between children and adults? Yes. Yep, very valid point from George. So they do look at the subgroup analysis of children. I'll, it's, it is a small number. And it, another question that comes out of this is obviously what does that bacterial carriage mean? But we can mm -hmm. absolutely. You're sure that's a, a interesting question that we were discussing as well. Is bacterial eradication important? Um, I guess if you've clinically improved and you no longer have symptoms does that mean that the carriage itself is significant it's definitely a discussion point and the other thing that we just wanted to highlight was um and someone had mentioned at the beginning is about the fact that in the uk our guidance is actually qds for 10 days um in the first place. So can we look at this data and say, can we reduce it down to five days? Do you, what do you think about that? So I guess everyone thinks that that's acceptable. So that's good, that applies to our population. Another thing we wanted to mention before moving on is that um, they essentially they generate this group um, using uh, rapid antigen testing for group A strep. So um, we don't have that in the UK. So it's a different, you know, what they're looking at is quite narrow in terms of the population that they're investigating. Again, does that really affect um, how we interpret the outcomes is a point of debate. Sorry, Personally, just... my suspicion is that the lack of point of care testing may even increase our benefits from the shorter course, because you imagine there's going to be a, a sizable proportion of those with a central criteria of three or four who who then just don't have group A strep, so don't benefit from the antibiotics anyway. So in a sense, they, they get no loss by having five days rather than 10 days antibiotics. That's my feeling. Yes. And I think George just said uh, what you said as well, Andrew. So that's... And Andrew, where do you work? Because the BD dosing, I've only come across that at Northwick Park. They said it was Australian. I knew it would be Northwick. <laughs> I'm just aware of the time, so we're just going to move on to the last question. Do you think that all the clinically important outcomes were considered in this study?
I feel like that's a yes. We uh, have no ideas, it must be a yes. yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. About the long term complications. And benefits worth the harms and costs potential. OK, I think we're getting we've got one. Yes. So we'll take that as a okay. benefit. So can we can we take the final vote then on your views now on the same clinical scenario in the beginning we said would you want to give five days or ten days so imagining again you're not constrained by a guideline what would you prefer to do now five days or ten days Wow, quite a lot of change going on there. Okay, I'm counting 12 people for five days and one for 10 days. So that's quite a big shift from what we had before, which was 11 people for 10 days and one for five days. So it suggests that this evidence has uh, has changed people's views of it. All right, keep your views coming. Uh, we can I'll count them further at the end. So I guess it's hard for us to come together as a group and give one consensus view, so we can't force a bottom line on you. But I certainly get the sense that uh, you're open-minded to the possibility that shorter courses might be uh, might be suitable for, for some of these children.